about how organisms evolve. Remember we said that individuals in a population do not evolve. It's the population, the group, evolves based on which characteristics at the current time are advantageous and which characteristics are not. Also, please remember we do not like to use in talking about evolution, strong and weak, those with the strong characteristics survive, those with the weak characteristics don't. We like to use advantageous, advantageous and not advantageous. Yeah, best suited, mm -hmm. right, right. Best suited is a great other way to explain it, but we just don't like to use strong and weak. It's kind of more of a human construct. Okay, so a little bit about populations. When we are looking at a population, let's think about the definition of a population. A population is a group of the same species. They live in the same place at the same time. What keeps the species going is that they can interbreed. So when we talk about this potential interbreeding, what that means is that not only can a biological male and female get together and they have sex, but they have offspring. And not only do they have offspring to keep the population going, but their offspring are fertile so that their offspring can potentially go on in their future once they become of reproductive age and they can have offspring. So we need that ability and evolution for the population to keep going over generations. So that's a very important kind of component of the idea of evolution is reproduction and successful reproduction. So a little bit of basics about genetics. This whole lecture, we're gonna go kind of back and forth to genetics. And we know that we've said that's an important thing about evolution because you can only pass on what genes or DNA that you have, the characteristics that you contain and your cells. So a gene pool, populations will share their gene pool. Gene pool means the sum of all of the variations of all of the traits in that population. So if we're just talking about like, for example, eye color in humans, all the different genes for eye color are part of the gene pool. Is purple eye color a component of our gene pool? No, we don't have purple. We don't have humans with purple, naturally purple eye color. So that would not be in our gene pool, but things like browns and greens and hazels, um, those would be in, and blue would be in our gene pool. Variation is very important. Variation means the differences in that trait. So eye color would be the trait. The variations would be things like brown, blue, hazel, green. Variation is very important in terms of evolution because if the environment suddenly changes, you hope as a population that somebody in your population or some portion of your population has traits that can survive in the new environment or given the new change in the environment. So a little review of genetics. An allele is an alternate form of a gene. So the gene is eye color, the alleles are brown, green, hazel, blue. When we take a look at our chromosomes in humans, and all of our cells, with the exception of our sperm cells and egg cells, humans have 46 chromosomes in each cell. You have 46 chromosomes because you've got 23 from your biological father from the sperm, 23 from the biological egg. 23 plus 23 make 46. You have two sets of 23 chromosomes. So you have a pair of homologous chromosomes for each of your different kinds of chromosomes. We have 23 pairs, two times 23, two of each kind of chromosomes. We have two number ones, two number twos, two number threes, two number fours, etc. Our 23rd pair is an XX if you are a biological female or an XY if you are a biological male. So this is what we would call, again, homologous chromosomes or a homologous pair. 
There's H-O-M-O -O again, which means similar. Remember, we talked about homologous structures, similar structures between organisms that show divergent evolution, have a common ancestor, but the traits have become different depending on the environment that they live in, what traits are best suited for that population. Uh, also, with your homologous chromosomes, you could have two of the same genes at any what we call a loci or gene location. Two of the same, two of the same, or you could have different genes at that location. So both of your parents could contribute the exact same kind of allele, or your parents could contribute to different alleles or genes. All right, so again, what does it have to do with evolution? Well, remember that evolution is based in DNA or genetics, that we can look at our genes right now in a population for a specific trait. We could look at it again, maybe a hundred generations from now and see, do the frequencies or percentages of a trait change over time? And what that tells us is that trait has evolved over time. If we have a change in the allele frequency or the percentage of that trait over time. Many of you will go on to take a genetics class, which is super cool, because then you'll learn about different kinds of inheritance. One of the easiest ways to track evolution in genetics is to look at complete dominance. The idea of complete dominance says that there are two alleles for a trait. There's a dominant and there's a recessive. And the recessive is masked in the presence of the dominant. It is there, it is just masked. So like for example, handedness in humans is a complete dominant trait. That if you are somebody who has two parents who are right-handed, but they each are right-handed and carry a left-handed gene, you could end up, you have a 25% chance of ending up with two recessive genes and being left-handed. However, if both your parents have dominant right-handed alleles, they have right-handed, right-handed allele and a right-handed, right-handed allele, it means that the offspring of your, par the offspring of your parents could only be right-handed because they could only contribute right-handed genes or alleles. If you have two parents who are left-handed, they have to be left-handed and left-handed, left-handed and left-handed, which means that if you have two left-handed parents, that they can only have children who are also left-handed. Again, frequency is something that we can trace over time. So we could see like the evidence that we talked about last week when we talked about limb structure or skull structure or fossils, biochemistry, Here's a way that we could talk about using math to track evolution over time by looking at the frequency or percentage of a trait or of alleles now, and then in many future generations and seeing if there are changes in frequency over time that would support that evolution is indeed happening because we have a change in the genes or the alleles in a population. They have evolved in number. We're going to come back to this idea at the end of this lecture and talk about Hardy Weinberg. Actually, we might, we, I think I'm gonna save that for Thursday, the Hardy Weinberg portion. We'll talk about something else. Because um, that will go with lab on Thursday. Okay, so allele frequency. It's the proportion, percentage of an allele, a gene, a specific kind of gene in the population. What's the percentage of right-handed genes in a population now? What's the percentage of left-handed genes in the population now? Let's look a hundred generations from now and see how those percentages or allele frequencies change. For example, if we have a hundred pea plants, so hundred pea plants, remember there's two alleles for every trait because you get one allele from biological mom, one from biological dad. So there's two alleles for every trait. Each individual, so me, if I'm talking about handedness, 
As one individual, I have two alleles for handedness. Or if you're talking about pea plants and you're talking about flower color, 100 individuals times two alleles for every trait give you 200 alleles that we're looking at in that population. If 50 alleles code for white flower color, what's the frequency of white flower color in the population? Remember that you have 50 alleles, good. 50 alleles that are white out of 200 total alleles in the population. So you're going to, oh sorry, you're going to figure out the percentage, 50 divided by 200, gives you 25%. 50 divided by 200, 0.25, or 25%. So that's how you could figure out the allele frequency in a population. Take the number of those alleles, divide by the number of alleles in the population, and that will give you the allele frequency or the percentage of that allele in the population. So we've got lots and lots of different ways to show that evolution is happening in a population, right? We talked about all of those different ways last week, and also we can use allele frequencies as well. I just have the title, I don't have the picture for you all. All right, so we're gonna talk a bit about mutations. When you have a change to an allele sequence or the DNA, that is a mutation. A change in the base sequence of the DNA from parent to offspring will give you a mutation. mutations are bad or in a lot of like superhero movies the mutants right they're bad in society but actually they're pretty good right because they got superpowers so I don't know people got it wrong mutations can be one of three outcomes one is is that they are bad and they can cause or a bad expression of that trait cause you to have a disease or cause the embryo to not develop the second thing is that it has no change. It's pretty similar what's coded for, the protein which eventually codes for something else, something else, something else, or whatever that characteristic is, it's very similar. So like for example, let's say that in, and I'm making this very simplistic, but genetics gets super complicated, um, but let's say that the, um, there's many genes that code for eye color. Let's say that one of the genes for eye color if you have two parents who have brown eyes and what they would code for when those two or all those alleles come together, those pairs, is that the offspring would also have brown eyes. Perhaps in one of the parents, one of the genes codes for brown also. Will that change the outcome of brown eyes and the offspring? No. Okay, so it could be the same. Or what if one of those genes codes for the ability to withstand UV radiation better. So now you've got offspring who have brown eyes, but their eyes are not affected by UV radiation as much as other individuals in the population. That's good, right? So there we can have a good mutation also. So you can have three different outcomes for that. Do these changes Mutations, good or bad, happen very often? No, they generally do not happen very often. Most often you're seeing changes in the base sequence that doesn't really make a big difference in the coding of the actual trait itself. It doesn't have an impact on that. But when it does, and it's passed on to the offspring, you can see a change from the parents, the copying of the DNA, and making where it's most significant, the sperm and the egg, to make their offspring, those mutations are most important when we're talking about evolution. Because if we're just talking about, like, let's say the, your heart cells in you. So your heart cells, they're replicating themselves as your heart cells get older, they replace themselves. 
But let's say that one of the cells of the million that make up your heart, it fails, it has a bad mutation, and that one cell of a million fails to make an offspring cell. Will that affect your overall <coughs> heart health? One cell that doesn't replicate of a million. Okay, so in that case, that mutation's not a big deal, right? So in our cells, kind of as a generality, is that when they replicate and there's a mutation, sometimes we have mutations that cause them not to replicate and because you have so many other cells, generally it's not a bad thing, not a big deal. But if you have a sperm cell or an egg cell and they have a mutation, who will it be significant to? The offspring. So there's a case in evolution where it's not like individual cells within your body that have mutations and something goes wrong or goes better even, it's usually not a big deal. But when the sperm has a mutation or an egg has a mutation, it may affect the offspring. And we know offspring then produce more offspring and keep generations going. And that's when we're talking about the significance of mutation in evolution. So one of the things about DNA is that DNA codes for, and you know, this you may remember back to, if you took Bio 111, you'll remember some of these things if you didn't take Bio 111. Get uh, a little review of it. So you have DNA. So here's, if you remember a little bit about, you have the idea. That DNA goes through a process to create different kinds of RNA. That's called transcription. You're making a transcript or a copy from kind of like one language, the language of DNA to the language of RNA. And then you have to take the language of RNA that holds that original DNA message, and then you translate it into protein. But not everything becomes a protein. They can become fats. They can become a wide variety of things in our bodies. So proteins are kind of like a placeholder for the most important things in your body. because these can go through metabolic pathways and proteins that are coded from DNA to RNA to protein, this little process here, can go off and become fats, lipids, different kinds of protein. Go from this original protein, go through metabolic processes to become a different kind of protein. Can go through metabolic processes to become some kind of lipid in your body. So this is not where it ends. You have what will happen is that this process will go through all kinds of metabolic pathways from here. And this idea of what the DNA coded for continues on and on and on and on until you get to the final product. So this is a lot more complex than maybe what you talked about in Bio 111, is that it's not just duh, 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 done. There's a lot more that's going to happen here. Okay, so when we're talking about final products, the final products that are coded for could be your physical appearance, we call that the phenotype, the genes, the genes in your DNA code for the genotype, the genes, eventually give rise to the phenotype, the physical expression of the genotype. But your Phenotypes can include how you physically look, how you act physiologically, how does your liver function, how does your heart beat, how do your neurons pass messages from themselves to other neurons, to glands, to muscles. How do you act? Your behaviors are based in DNA. So, like, for example, the behavior, like if I took something and I was like, took that stapler and you were starting to fall asleep and I chucked it at your head, are you just gonna be like, yay, and let it hit you in the head? No, likely, if you're not asleep already, you're gonna go, 
right? Your instinct, your behavior, based on your DNA for survival, is to move out of the way of things that are coming, flying at you. So your DNA codes for how you look, how we physiologically act, and how we behaviorally act. So our genes can code for a wide variety of things, not just how we look. We cannot change our DNA in anticipation of the environment changing. So again, if the world starts flooding, I can't just be like, I want gills, boom, right? I can't will myself because I'm anticipating, uh oh, the environment's changing. I can't make my genes change. I either survive or I don't. That's the way it is. So mutations are not caused by the environment. Mutations are there already. So let's say that the world starts to flood and you have the ability, you have already mutations that make you a better swimmer. You are, you have genes that are favored in the change of environment. Did you change those genes because the environment changed? They were there, right? They were already there. That's the way mutations happen, is that we have all kinds of mutations in our body. Some of them we never take advantage of because those things, we look, the way we look, the way we act, our internal physiology, some of those things are not favored right now. They don't help us or hinder us in our survival. But perhaps the environment changes and you may have some mutations that make you favored in that environment. So the environment does not cause mutation when we're talking about evolution. We have the mutations there. If the environment changes, maybe your favor, maybe a group of us are favored, and we can keep our population going. Mutations happen by chance. Mutations are mistakes in the copying of the DNA from one cell to the other. So cells have an unbelievable amount of information in the little tiny microscopic cells. They've got, so let's say like your notebook, as an analogy, let's say that the amount of information in a cell has eight of those notebooks. That much information in that teeny little microscopic cell. Your cells, the process of either making sperm or making egg is happening. So you're going from one cell to making sperm or egg. We know those are gonna be passed on to the offspring. So let's say that you have to copy eight of those books in 20 minutes. Do you think mistakes will be made? Uh, for? I'm not sure the exact number, but yes, there's a significant number of mutations that happen because making our cells happens very, very quickly. Now granted, there's little checkpoints that are like spell checkers that are like, let me look over the copying of this. But do you think like a few checkpoints that they let mistakes go by also? Uh, for sure, yeah. So because this, these processes of making parent cells to offspring cells happen so quickly, the likelihood of mutations is pretty high. But again, it just depends on, is that mutation a big deal or not? Well, we don't know. Now, do your parents' cells, the cell that's making you their sperm or egg, do they sit there and go, I am going to force all of the possible mutations that will make my offspring better in the future. I'm going to think about every possible environmental change, and I'm going to force those mutations into that sperm or egg. Does that happen? No, that does not happen. So they just do their best. Cells are not intentionally trying to force mutations. Cells are just trying to survive. They're like, okay, my job is, I'm gonna take my information and I'm gonna put it into this cell. I'm gonna do my best to copy it directly and exactly. But they do their best, right? Mutations happen. The spell checkers, 
all of those checkpoints, they do their best to check everything over, but mistakes still happen. So any mutations that are carried in us, offspring from whoever our biological parents are, our mutations are all just like by chance. They just happen, they weren't willed, they weren't forced by the environment, there was no choice involved. It's all just random mistakes. All right, so here I go into, yeah, sometimes they're harmful or lethal, sometimes they make us better, a lot of times they just don't do anything, they code for an equivalent protein, thus way you look, way your physiology works, or your behavior. So it could be a variety of any situation that we have. Mutation provides the potential for evolutionary change. Does it mean that it absolutely causes evolutionary change? No. Because again, the environment, if the environment's pretty stable in a population, then everybody's favored or you know whatever traits not maybe not everybody but certain traits are favored at that time right it's when the environment changes it's like well what's in those mutations is that going to keep us going or not so is evolution pretty random yeah so we're essentially randomly here so Evolution will spread certain beneficial mutations throughout a population given the current nature, natural selection, the current environment, natural selection, nature selects for those of the most advantageous traits at the current time. So we have an influence, the environment influences what traits in a population are favored. Now, again, think about those owls, that when there's snow around, the white the more white owls are favored. When there's no snow around, the light brown or the brown owls are more favored. And so it just depends, the environment influences what percentage of the population is gonna be favored. Is it gonna be white owls? Is it gonna be the brown owls? What if suddenly something happens and the trees turn red? Nobody's favored. The owls could go extinct. And don't forget that those individuals with advantageous traits have a much easier time surviving in the environment. If you have an easy time surviving, you've got time to reproduce, you've got the time, the energy, and in the current environment, your advantageous traits then are passed on to your offspring. Those with advantageous traits who have more time and energy to reproduce are going to pump out offspring that have the more advantageous traits. Those that don't have the advantageous traits aren't going to have time. So the frequency of that trait is gonna go lower and lower in the population. The advantageous traits are gonna go higher and higher. But again, the environment can change and that can switch over time. And so evolution, the traits that are favored can go back and forth or the species can totally go away because nobody's favored. So natural selection means that it's not, and again, when we talk about the environment selects, it's just like environment favors those with favorable traits. The environment's not picking. Like I think, the environment's not like, I think the, the brown owls are the most beautiful. I'm going to choose them. No, it just like, it snows or it doesn't. But remember that the mutations, the different alleles for feather color just came about by chance. They're mutations. So let's answer this question. Most commercial pesticides are effective for only about two to three years. Why? Give us a read over.
So I'm going to go through this with you and how I would look at this question. So well, I'm going to start with A. New pests invade the area. May, I mean, maybe, you know, let's put that on hold. Maybe, maybe. The chemicals induce mutations that convey immunity, meaning that they cause, do the chemicals cause mutations? No, I mean, they don't do that. I mean, they, and when we're talking about evolution, maybe they would cause some mutations or something bad to happen to the species, but we're not talking about that. When we're talking about evolution, we're talking about does the making of the populations one generation or the next generation, is that effective? So no, the environment is not causing the mutations. Do the chemicals mutate? They're usually pretty stable, so no, that's not a good answer. The pests learn to ignore the chemicals? Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe their behaviors change over time, that's a possibility. So maybe A, maybe D. Those pests with advantageous mutations survive and reproduce. Oh, oh, hey. That sounds really good, right? Okay, so that's why I kind of go through and I'm like, nah, nah, this one's the best one, right? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sure. So adaptations are those mutations that are favored cause individuals to have an easier time surviving. Your adaptations are all of your, how you look, how your physiology works, how you behave. Those are your adaptations. Everything that your DNA codes for. So, you know, kind of interesting, like 111 concepts are building on that, right? We're just like keep, and that's what you're going to see is that with like 111, you're gonna to continue to build, you're gonna take this class perhaps, then you go on to take a um, ecology and evolution class, you're gonna build on the foundation that you learned here. So there's a lot of important things about not only just getting an A in this class, but it's understanding this information because what happens in your college career, especially as I was reading through all the information about you all, you're all going into very like competitive careers where you're going to take more and more biologies and it just kind of starts to build on the foundations of each other. And so what you learn in here is gonna be important next year and the year after, and in your um, training as medical professionals or master's degrees, PhDs. So we see that some of this, it's like, oh, it keeps expanding. Fitness. Fitness, when we talk about evolution, it's not like, oh, I can work out. I'm very fit, I can exercise. Fitness regards how many offspring can you leave to the next generation? How can I contribute to keeping my population going? So my fitness is better if I have, let's say, four offspring, as opposed to somebody who has no offspring or one offspring. So the more offspring you can leave, the greater your fitness. Evolution, another way that we describe it is survival of the fittest. Those with advantageous traits probably pass on those advantageous traits to their offspring and offspring passed on the number that you pass on with most advantageous traits increases the advantageous traits in the population at a higher frequency and shows that our population can better survive in the environment. It all kind of wraps up into evolution. Beneficial traits appear more often in offspring over time. Because again, individuals who have an easier time surviving have an easier time reproducing. They have time and energy for that. And because they have time and energy, it means that they had some good traits in the current environment right now. So beneficial mutations increase and frequency over time until the environment changes and then again that might change over time or certain traits might go away or individuals in the population all of us may go away if the change is not represented in our gene pool so again natural selection survival of the fittest ability to contribute to the future survival through adding offspring with beneficial traits in the population. Okay. So 
more genes than you can add to the gene pool. Diversity of the gene pool, variation in the gene pool is really good because environment changes over time. We've seen that for billions of years. All right, so a little bit about what you're an application of what you're doing in lab today, talking about bacterial populations. So what you all did on Thursday was you made four plates. You made one control plate. The first plate was just you swapped it with the bacteria that we were using in the experiment. What we want to see in our control plate is we're gonna take that out and make sure there's growth. That tells us that the bacterial population was competent or able to grow on that medium that we're using and the other parts of the experiment. Then we also place six different kinds of antibiotics. In our example here, we're gonna look at one kind of antibiotic and how that affects the future of this particular bacterial population. So put down the antibiotic, bacteria are in here, swipe, 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 swipe. And what we find after a few days in the incubator, a nice warm environment that favors the growth of the bacteria on this particular medium, the agar to grow, that we find that the population, we start out with this many populations, and we end up with one, two, three, four populations on each of the plates. Um, in this case, the antibiotic was in the agar. Okay, so out of all of these populations, the favorable mutations were this one, this one, this one, and this one, right? These were favored. In the presence of this particular antibiotic, they are able to survive. So in our population, we've got two traits. Individuals who can survive in the presence of this antibiotic and individuals who cannot survive in the presence of this antibiotic. So these individuals, before they were ever exposed to the antibiotic, they already had a mutation to survive in the presence of it. Now these that survive, what if we expose them to a different antibiotic? Let's say that our outcome So antibiotic A favored these individuals. Now we do antibiotic B. We, whoever survived antibiotic A, we're gonna see can they survive antibiotic B. Is there a guarantee that because these individuals survived antibiotic A, they will survive antibiotic B? Good. No is the correct answer because it's a different antibiotic. So now they need to also have had the gene for not only resistance to antibiotic A, but also resistance to antibiotic B. So let's see what happens. Let's see. Now we have one population on the plates that survives. All right, so now let's say we go to antibiotic C. Is it a guarantee that they are all going to survive antibiotic C? No, right? They have to have now, already have resistance to A, B, and C. Okay, so let's see what happens. They're all dead. Each antibiotic is different. The way that 
that bacteria can survive is having a variation of resistance to many different kinds of antibiotics. And we do have some of those bacteria in our society, right? For example, if this original population, they have a resistance to one, two different kinds of antibiotic, we might call them some of these super bugs because they have resistance to more than one kind of antibiotic. So let's say that you have some kind of infection and it gets treated with antibiotic B, but you still have that infection going on, they're gonna try something else. And what if this had growth still? Now they gotta try another antibiotic. And what if there's growth still? Now they have to try another antibiotic. And that's where we're at in society, is that we're finding that, and we're going to get into how this happens when we get into the diversity unit next, is they are starting to, they already have these resistances, and then we'll talk about ways that they can also share resistances, which adds to not only that idea of what do you have before in mutation, but what can you accumulate while you're alive, which is very different. We can't do that, right? Can we accumulate DNA? In general, no, right? Like we're talking about CRISPR as a technology where they can get in and maybe change our genes, but does that affect you necessarily? And uh, more so affects like your offspring. And in some cases, like with people with cystic fibrosis, we might have a virus that we can change DNA to, to deliver the gene you're missing. So we're starting to manipulate this idea of you get what you get when you're born as a organism is that we're seeing that we have figured out technologies that have an influence on our evolution in society. And bacteria definitely have some tricky tricks that they're doing. Okay, so let's answer a couple of questions. Let's read these over. A bacterial allele that conveys resistance to the antibiotic streptomycin is always beneficial to the bacterial cell? No, I mean, if it's never around streptomycin, who cares that it has this mutation to streptomycin because it never gets to actually use it, right? So it could have a potentially beneficial mutation, but if it's never in the environment where that mutation is actually beneficial, it doesn't matter. Is beneficial to the cell in the presence of streptomycin? Well, that sounds pretty good, right? Yeah, so if it has an allele that gives it resistance to streptomycin and then it's exposed to streptomycin, it can survive. Is neutral, neither beneficial or detrimental to the cell? Well, no, it's in streptomycin. It's an antibiotic that can kill it, but it has resistance to streptomycin, so no, that's not good. Is beneficial to the cell in the absence of streptomycin? No, that's kind of like the same as this, right? And is always detrimental to the cell? No. Good. So definitely B is the best. Now, let's take a look at the next question. Bacteria get resistance to antibiotics because they are in the presence of the antibiotic and mutate to become better suited to living in that environment. So when they are exposed to streptomycin, can they be like, let's make a gene to survive this? Can we do that? Can they do that? No. Uh -uh. Does the antibiotic cause the mutation? No, the antibiotic doesn't cause the mutation to make it the bacteria survive in the presence of the antibiotic. No, it doesn't work like that. Because some of them just happen to have a mutation to the antibiotic already, okay? They survive, okay, and pass on those antibiotic genes to their offspring. I like that one. That sounds good. Sounds like things that we've been talking about, right? Because the environment influences the bacteria to have the mutation. No. It, it influences those that have already have the mutation, but not doesn't give influence to the mutation. Okay, so the best one was C. when you are writing up today's lab, very critical to you doing well on this lab will be your ability to clearly explain what this means, because there's a lot of vocabulary in here, right? But we said only one of them had the vocabulary in the right logical order. 
And so this lab is typically a tough one because you have to really understand all that we've been talking about in lecture today and be able to write the vocabulary words in the correct way. You can't just, and sometimes students will be like, I'm just gonna throw in like by chance, mutation, advantageous, fitness, environment selects for, and just put it in any order. Uh -huh. So make sure you have your notebook out today when you're writing up the lab. Make sure as a group you are discussing. Also make sure, I'm not done yet, I'm worried to keep going, but I'm just explaining about lab today. Make sure you are working together to bounce ideas off each other, you're having good discussions, but also make sure you are all not writing the same thing. I do not want one person being like, this is the answer, blah, 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 and you all go, cool, blah, 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 blah. Because all four of you are gonna get a zero on the lab. And then I'm going to write up the academic integrity form that you've all cheated, you've plagiarized. So you all should discuss and then write in your own words. Use your notes. Think. Definitely think about what's happening. But don't just hear what someone else said and go, I, I like that, I'm gonna write all that down. Because you know what, the person who said it, they're probably writing that down. So use your words. Your own examples, your own expression of the material. Take your time and think about these answers. You should have pretty thorough answers, pretty hefty answers today. If you can answer in like three words, you have not done enough. So again, environment selects for, environment favors. Individuals that already have mutations that are favored, that those individuals can survive in that environment right now. Frequencies of mutations can change over time with changes in the environment. Mutations cause variability. Variability ups your chances to survive if the environment changes. Does it guarantee? It does not guarantee, but it definitely adds to the population's ability to survive. Okay, other modes of natural selection. Gene flow is a mode of natural selection. It means that the genes can be shared between our population and another human population. So one example of gene flow, let's say that out here, we have two populations of mice that are separated by a road because the road is regularly traveled by humans, the mice are like, I'm nervous about crossing the road. So you've got one over here and you've got one population over here. They never meet up, they're totally separate populations. And this population, the main sizes are small and medium, and this population across the road are medium and large. Do they have a similar trait in common? Medium, yes. So they both share medium, but one has small that the other one doesn't have, and the other one has large, but the, this one doesn't have. But let's say that Morin Valley is working on a conservation project, and they're like, something happens with the mice, and they're one of the last mouse populations of this species on the planet, and we're like, okay, let's do our job. Let's stop travel on that road. Let's break it up, and let's make this population able to share gene pools because originally their pools are different, right? This one has small and medium, this one has medium and large. And so now we're going to make them become more similar over time. So when populations are apart and they come together, they may offer new genes into the greater population. And that's what we call gene flow. Gene flow is just a fancy way of saying sex between members of different populations. A population means it's a species that lives in different places at the same time. Our population, we are one population because we live in the same area, we interact at the same time. So different populations would not have contact, but if they do suddenly have contact, they might be adding 
new gene combinations to the overall new larger population. Eventually what we see is the two populations become more similar. They were more different. Now they share three genes as opposed to two each. Drift is another way that we can see an influence in evolution. Okay, so here's where diversity in a population is going to be very critical to the future of a population. The smaller a population, a change in the environment may be a bigger impact. You have a really big population and you have a change, you might have more variation, maybe. So like for example, let's say in this population, we've only got these uh, 20 individuals to start with. In our population, what we can see is two different phenotypes. We can see dark brown and beige, but we have three different genotypes. We have capital B, capital B, capital B, small b, anybody who has a capital letter is going to express the dominant trait of being dark in color. So what we call recessive trait are two recessive alleles, little b, little b. So we have two phenotypes with three different genotypes. Something happens in the population where only two individuals survive. Randomly, maybe it's this one and this one. Okay. So now, when these two are left, and they got a lot of pressure to mate, what's going to happen two individuals. One individual was a dark brown. We can see that they are big B, little b. The other, light brown, little b, little b. We're going to take these genes and put them down. These genes across. These will be all the possible gene combinations that their offspring can have. Now, in our next generation, because the environment changed, we went from having two phenotypes and three genotypes to two phenotypes and two genotypes. We have eliminated, with this change, and only two individuals surviving, we do not have that big B, big B genotype anymore. Okay, so again, here's your offspring. They have 20 offspring. Of those 20 offspring, only two survive. It's those two, little b, little b, and little b, little b. So now, in our third generation, with all these environmental changes that have happened, we went from three genotypes and two phenotypes to one genotype and one phenotype left. The diversity of our population has decreased over time. So what are some causes of this happening? There's two causes. One is population bottleneck and the other is the founder effect. So the bottleneck is usually like some catastrophe happens. There's a hurricane, there's an earthquake, there's an enormous snowstorm, there's a tidal wave. Could be also human induced, could be that the humans are like, we just want to eat them all and they just overhunt them and leave just a couple left. Generally, it depends on the size of the population, but this generally will reduce the variation in the population, just like we saw in the example before. We call this a bottleneck because the idea is, is like the population exists in a bottle, like a pop bottle, for example. And we have different colored 
balls that represent all of the different variations in that population. And so we start out with four different colors. And let's say that the catastrophic event is just represented by, we take that bottle and we shake out just a few. Who's left represents the variation. In this case, what has happened is that whatever this catastrophic, catastrophic event was, only left two of the four original variations in the population, which means that you can see over generations that you only have half of the original variation due to that catastrophic event. One example is the northern elephant seal. It was hunted to almost extinction in the early 1800s. There were about 30, I would sorry, 20 individuals that were left. They did bring the population back up to about 30,000, but these 20 individuals were really similar genetically. And so even though you have a few that survived and they did bring the numbers up, here's the danger, is that if everybody's almost exactly the same, one virus, bacteria, one hunting event could wipe everybody out. So again, better to be more genetically variant. All right, founder effect is that a group from the big population leaves and they start a population somewhere else. They find, they found a population in a new area. What may happen is that group are similar enough that they don't bring a variation of the entire population. I mean, it'd be great if they were like, okay, you're different, you're different, you're different, you're different, you're different. Let's all go and start a new population elsewhere. We've got representatives of all the different kinds in our population, but it usually doesn't happen that way. So usually the frequencies of the variations in the gene pool go way down. They do not represent the variety of the original population. There are Amish populations in the northeast portion of the United States that have become very isolated genetically from the rest of the United States, that they have carried a disease called Kruthfeld Jacob, and it's a genetic disease, so that when two individuals who are both carriers for that disease get together, they see that their offspring have this disease. And a couple things that manifest because of that disease is one, is that the individual usually has like an extra finger, which would be great, right? You have more fingers on a hand, you could grasp better. So that might be beneficial. But the other thing is that the torso is usually shorter, which causes a lot of issues with the organs in the torso, which are a lot of important stuff, like heart lungs, for example, and lead to very significant health issues in their offspring. All right, so we're gonna stop there. I'm only four minutes. There. All right, today we're going to take a look at the outcomes of our plates. I'll talk about lab once we get in there.